bit of highlight from our men's retreat, which is based on chapters 1 through 8. I'm going to pray predominantly be in chapters 5 and 6 this morning. But you might be here today and going, well, that's an Old Testament story. What do the Old Testament stories have to do with us as New Testament believers? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it tells us exactly. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And in 1 Corinthians ten six, Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up and play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. And 1 Corinthians 11 verse number 10 says this specifically to us. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, on whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. For no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So here it clearly says all of these things are a part of a spiritual picture for us. As children of Israel, they became slaves in Egypt. Egypt is a picture of the world. And whenever we sin, we become a slave to sin. And the wages of sin is? How often? Every time. And so what starts out in people's lives is something, oh, that'd be fun. This is exciting. Oh, let's party. Let's do this. All of a sudden becomes an addiction in people's lives at which they become slaves to and don't even want to do it anymore, but they can't get free from it. And so here's what happened. God, by his Passover, would release them from the world, the land of Egypt. By the shedding of the blood of the Lamb, which would become a tremendous spiritual picture that Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God, would pay the price of salvation for every single person. They were led out by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 10 says that when they came to the Red Sea, it was like a baptism. It is a picture of water baptism. And again, if you've never been water baptized, June 14th, be there. Because it is a step of obedience in our growth to the, with the Lord. Then what we find out happening, they go into the promised land. They come to the, or they go into the wilderness, excuse me. They come to the edge of the promised land and they send 12 spies into the land. 10 of them come back with a bad report. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, come back with a good report. But my friends, I want you to think about the influence of 10 people spreading a bad report. Do you realize what ended up happening? An entire nation would perish in the wilderness because of it. In Proverbs chapter 6, it lists out things that the Lord hates. My friends, is there anybody here that wants to be on the side the Lord hates? I, I, I'm for sure, I, I don't want to be on the side that the Lord hates. And you know what the Lord hates? Not mildly dislikes. The Lord hates those that sow seeds of discord. And that's what these 10 did. And do you know something about human nature? We are all willing to believe a bad report, aren't we? 
We're all willing to believe a lie. We're all willing to believe an exaggeration. Now, I got to tell you something. When I first started out pastoring, and I've been a pastor for 40 years now. In fact, this year is a milestone for me. 40 years ago in September, I asked Jesus into my heart an entire generation ago. And I've been here 25 years. But they, some of you are going, oh no, how much longer? No, no, no. But here's the thing. In the old days, you know how people spread bad reports? They did it by phone. You know how they do it today? It's this thing called Facebook. It's gossip on steroids. And I want to tell you something. The Lord hates those that sow seeds of discord. And so what ended up happening? An entire nation would perish in the wilderness. 40 years have passed by and now there is a new generation. There is a new leader. His name is Joshua. And in Joshua chapter 1, Moses is gone. Can you imagine having to follow Moses? I, I, those would be big shoes to have to follow, right? But here's the deal, and all the way through the Bible, the Bible calls us to raise up the next generation. And my friends, even as you listen to the announcements this morning, it's children's ministry, it's vacation Bible school, it's kids camp, it's Wednesday night. We have our entire ministry here. When you think of the effort that's put into the next generation, our K through 12 school, our Bible college, our youth groups, all of these things are determined to do what God has called us to do absolutely to raise up that next generation. Moses is the, or I mean, Joshua is the product of that. And in Joshua chapter one, Three different times God speaks to Joshua, and Joshua 1.9 is one of the theme scriptures for our church here at Joshua Springs. And it says, have I not commanded you to be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Three different times the Lord said, do not be afraid. Why did the Lord have to tell Joshua three times not to be afraid? Very simple, Joshua was afraid. And my friends, as we go on into chapter 3, it comes to the time where they are to cross over after 40 years in the wilderness into the promised land. Now I want to tell you, those in Jericho and all the Canaanite cities, they had heard of what God had done in Egypt. It's not that far away. And my friends, they knew that the most powerful empire that the world had ever known, the Egyptian empire, was destroyed by the God of the Hebrews through the plagues that happened and then through Pharaoh's army drowning in the Red Sea. And now these same people are are coming to them. But they thought they had time. Because the Jordan River was at flood stage. What they didn't know was what God was going to do. And again, a second miracle where he would stop up the Jordan River and they would cross through way before they thought that they could. Now, my friends, here's the important part of this. God tells the children of Israel through Joshua, send forth the ark. The priests would carry the ark. And when their feet got in the water of the Jordan River, the floodwaters would stop. And my friends, I want to remind you of something. You have to get your feet wet. You have to step out in faith first. They could have stood forever on the side of the banks of the Jordan, wait for the water to stop, and it never would have happened because God told them to get their feet wet. I love the story of Peter where Peter stepped out of the boat and he walked on water. And I know it's easy to criticize Peter because he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. But I want to tell you, he is the only disciple that walked on water. And why did he walk on water? Because he got his feet wet. And what's the call of God for us? We've got to be willing to step out in faith and get our feet wet. Now, this is a beautiful spiritual picture as well. This place of the crossing from time immemorial, the Arabs have a name for it. 
We go there every time we go to Israel now. Uh, we couldn't go there for a long time, but now we can go there. And in, in Arabic, it's Kasar el Yahud. It's the crossing of the Jews. And we know exactly where it took place. And my friends, there's something very important about that place. That is the exact place where Jesus was baptized. And what happened when Jesus was baptized? The Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove in bodily form. And a voice from heaven, from our heavenly father said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the crossing over of the Jordan River is a picture of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, my friends, I know the Trinity. The Trinity is hard for us to understand, isn't it? I, we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, the Father. Is there going to be another throne for uh, the Holy Spirit up there? And again, my friends, all analogies fall short. But I want to give you the one that helps me understand the most. Because we serve one God. We don't have three gods. We have one God, the Lord our God the Lord is one. It's echad. It is a compound unity. In the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image. And so, because God's God, we can never contain him. But the illustration that helps me understand the Trinity is the most is our earthly son. Our earthly son is made up of energy. And the reality is our earth is located exactly where it needs to be. If we were any closer, we'd burn up. If we were any farther away, we'd freeze to death. So the earth is exactly where it has to be in order to sustain life. And the reality is this. If I get any closer to the sun, I'm going to be consumed. And the Bible says no man can see God and live. But here's the reality. If I go outside right now, I look up, I, I see the sun, don't I? And as I see that sun, that light is a visible expression of everything that the sun is. And so it is with Jesus. Jesus is the visible expression of God. My little pea brain could not possibly ever contain all of what God is. But when I read about Jesus... And I see what he does. I understand God. And I understand the miracles. And we're going to see a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the scriptures today. And yet, as I go outside, not only can I see the light of this massive amount of energy that would consume me if I would be any closer. I also feel the heat. And it's like the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But I want to ask you something. Do we have three sons? How many sons do we have? This isn't a hard question. How many sons do we have? It's not a trick question. There's only one up there, isn't it? But it affects us in three different ways. So I don't know. For me, it helps understand the Trinity. And so what do we have here? We have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So picking up in chapter 5, verse number 13. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite. This is none other than a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to know it because Joshua is going to call him Lord. This is Jesus Christ appearing. In the Old Testament, we have a number of places where Jesus appears. And this is one of those places. And so he looks... And a man stood opposite of him with his sword drawn in his right hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. I love that. You know, I've had that experience many times here at Joshua Springs. When Joshua Springs Lightning is playing for a CIF football championship... And we're playing another Christian school. Is God for us or for them? And the answer is no. He's not for either. The reality is this. You see, 
I am not in the business of trying to get God on my side. Are you for us or for our adversaries? No, that's not the question. The question is, are we on God's side? This is where Joshua has to come to. We have to decide in our hearts, and here's the answer. No, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. We've got to be on God's side. What's the difference between a live wire and a dead wire? It's very simple. It is what is connected to. And so for us, we have to understand what's happening here. This is the commission of Joshua. Just like Moses was commissioned at the burning bush, now Joshua is being commissioned here. And he takes his sandals off of his feet and he acknowledges that Jesus Christ is the commander of the Lord's army. And for us, my friends, we have to remember, in the New Testament, Jesus said there was somebody who had greater faith than anybody else that he had ever known in Israel. Who was it? It was a Roman centurion. Wasn't even a Jew. It was a Roman centurion because this Roman centurion, when he had asked Jesus for a healing, Jesus was going to come to his house. And he said, wait a minute, you don't need to come to my house. All you have to do is speak the word. I'm a man under authority. And I have men under me. And I tell this one, go, and he goes. This one, come, and he comes. And Jesus said, I want to tell you, I've not found such great faith in all of Israel. And my friends, it's one of the things I love about pastoring here. Because my friends, through the last 25 years, I want to tell you, we have had incredible people who have been in the Marine Corps, in the Navy, fantastic men and women of, of, of just stellar character because they loved the Lord, but they understood what it meant to be under authority. And my friends, in the book of 2 Timothy, the Bible lays out to us as believers in 2 Timothy chapter 2, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you see it again? What is the calling of God for us? We are to raise up the next generation. The things that Timothy had learned, how did he learn them? He learned them from the Apostle Paul. Now, Timothy was to pass on what he had learned from Paul to the next generation, and that's exactly what we're called to do. But then he says this, You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. My friends, out here at 29 Palms, when the commander orders a unit to go to Afghanistan, do the guys in that unit go, I don't think I want to go there. I, I don't feel like it today. That's not the way it works, is it? An order is given and it's followed out, right? Should there be any less for us in the army of God? You know, it, it's so interesting. My very first time in coming to Yucca Valley was 1976. Now, I'd never been to California. I'd never seen an ocean in my life. I was from Kansas. I was a farm boy out there. And, and we had a carload of people and we drive into California through Amboy. And then we get to Wonder Valley. You know why it's called Wonder Valley. You wonder why anybody lives out there. That's why it's called Wonder Valley. And I remember in 1976, the edge of town in Yucca Valley was Kentucky Fried Chicken. And there was one fast food restaurant. It was called Noggles, and it's where the old Del Taco is today. 
And so I'm in this carload of people. Now, mind you, I'm a farmer. I'm from Kansas. I'm inheriting a farm. I, I'm driving into Yucca Valley. Out loud in the car, I say, this is the most God-forsaken place I've ever seen in my life. I would never live here. I tell you, I heard a still small voice that said, oh, yes, you will. (laughs) But here's the thing. I didn't choose to live in Yucca Valley. The Lord chose it. But I want to tell you, I'm happy he did. I love Yucca Valley. I I love the desert. I love the, the crystal clear nights. I'm glad God didn't put... I've lived in the low desert before. You know what we call that? Down below, right? Because it's closer to hell. And if you don't believe it from now till August, it's convincing every time you go down there. (laughs) Marilee and I were down there this last week and we said, well, this could be one of our last trips down here till October, you know. And I I tell you, as much as I love the ocean... I wouldn't want to live in Orange County or the Inland Empire and definitely not Los Angeles. You know, California was supposed to have the big earthquake this week. Do you remember that? You know, all the planets aligned and there was supposed to be the earthquake. That was happening on May 28th. You know what Marilee and I did that day? We went down and watched the movie uh, San Andreas. We thought, you know, if it's going to happen, we want to see the movie first, you know. But the reality is, and and this is true, if there's going to be a big earthquake, I guarantee you I'd rather be in Yucca Valley than Los Angeles. Positive about that fact. But here's the thing. I love it. And, And honestly, when I'm down there fighting all that, and I love living here because you can do all that stuff down there, but don't have to live in it. And I tell you, almost every time when I'm driving up the Yucca grade after being down below, In the Inland Empire, Los Angeles, I go, thank you, Lord. I don't have to deal with that. I love living in a place where five miles means five minutes. Not five miles could mean who knows how long, you know. And I can find a parking spot when I get there. But here's the deal. It doesn't matter whether we like or don't like. Do we weigh out the decisions in our life? My friends, here's the reality. We need to submit our heart to God's will because God knows best in our lives. And here's what we're going to find. Joshua is going to have a tremendous victory in his life because he's willing to submit unconditionally to the commander of the Lord's army. And my friends, there's only one way that you're going to have victory in your life, and that's when you're willing to unconditionally say, I want to do what the Lord wants me to do. I want to tell you the greatest leaders in the world are those who are led. The greatest rulers in the world are those who are ruled, and that's exactly what's happening to Joshua. Stop thinking that you are the commander of your own life, and start looking to the Lord in an unconditional surrender to Him that says, I want your will in my life. And in chapter 6, it says, now Jericho was securely shut up. Because of the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand and the kings and this mighty men of valor. God is telling Jericho, I have already given you the victory. And my friends, in the book of Zechariah, there is a key. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 6, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Say it with me. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. Again, it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. Now, my friends, the reality is this. We are going to face battles. Here, the Lord is saying, you're going to have a battle. And we as believers in the promised land, because they're now in the promised land, we're going to face lots of obstacles in our life. We're going to face a lot of Jerichos in our life. And in John chapter 16, Jesus tells us this in verse 33. Jesus said, 
These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And how do we have victory? By submitting ourselves to the Lord. I want to tell, tell you a story. We've been kind of following it. One of uh, our elementary teachers at Yaka El, Camille, has organized this student-led prayer around the pole. And they've been having every Thursday morning at Yaka El like 35 kids that are in prayer. And so the principal told Camille that she had to stop, cease, and desist. And she couldn't have this anymore, even though it was student-led. And Camille contacted the Pacific Justice, who wrote a letter to the Morongo Unified School District and said, if by Thursday there's any problems, we're bringing a lawsuit against you. (laughs) Kids have a right to pray. Let me tell you, is it not crazy that we think the most dangerous thing to our government schools is the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, there's a lot bigger problems. And my friends, but we're going to face trouble in our lives. And the reality is the scripture says here, I have given you the victory. I have past tense, given Jericho in your hand. They haven't even had the battle yet, but the victory was theirs. You shall march around the city, you and all the men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Then it shall come to pass, when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpets, that all the people will shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Okay, you're Joshua. The Lord has just spoken to your heart. Now you're on your way back to the tent to tell your commanders the battle plan. Okay, this is our battle plan. First of all, we're going to march around the city. We're going to have rams blowing horns. We're going to carry the ark of the people, and everybody's got to be quiet. We're going to do that for six days, one day a week. And on the seventh day, we're going to march around seven times, all blow trumpets and shout, shout, and the walls are going to fall down. New commander, please. Can can we have a second opinion here? My friends, does this sound like any battle plan to you? But I want to tell you something. God's ways are not our ways. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible lays out this. In verse number 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh... Not many mighty, not many noble are called. And this is the classification that we fit in. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. When you look at the size of Yucca Valley, I want to tell you something. There's no way there should be a Joshua Springs Calvary Chapel in a town like that. How'd you all get here? How many of you started out the first time that you saw Yucca Valley going, this is the most God-forsaken place I've ever seen? Is there anybody that the very first time they came up here went, this is the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life, I want to live here? Is there anyone? Oh, wow, we have one or two. You were born here. That doesn't count. (laughs) You were born here. You don't know anything else. No. Here's the thing. I always say, you know what Yucca Valley's for? It's it's a place where God can put people. He has no idea where else to put them. So you can be out here. 
But here is the thing. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Here's why. That no flesh should glory in his presence. This is the battle plan. You're just going to march around the city one time a day. You're going to have the army. Then you're going to have people blowing ram's horns. Then you're going to have people carrying the ark. Then you're going to have a rear guard. And you're going to have all the people following it. You're going to do that for six days on the seventh day. You're going to do it seven times. Then you're going to blow the trumpets. Everybody's going to shout and the walls are going to fall down. Because no glory, no flesh can glory in his presence. It's God. It's not by might nor by power but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And in verse number six, so Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, proceed and march around this city and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. And so it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets of the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpet and the rear guard came after the ark while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. I have a ram's horn from Israel. You know, the big circular ram's horn. Well, it was funny. On on Friday, I was getting ready to go up to the men's retreat and I decided to take it with you. Because again, we read these stories, but we forget these are real events that happen. I want to tell you to blow a ram's horn is a very hard and difficult thing to do. And these men blew it all the way around the city. So I go in the, in the church office and all the secretaries are there and I blow this ram's horn and it sounds like a sick goat, you know, you know, and they're all laughing at me. Here's what they do. They send me a video on how to blow a ram's horn. Anybody looking for used secretaries? So we go up there to the men's retreat and, you know, I, I asked Dylan and Dylan actually does it pretty good. And then that night when he goes to blow it, he can't make it work. And then Dan Letourneau does it. He can't make it work. Somebody else tried it. They could. But the point was this. It's not an easy thing to do. We just read over these scriptures. It, it, it's something to be able to blow a ram's horn. It takes a lot of air and to go completely around the city. The scripture goes on. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I say to you, shout, and then you will shout. All right, we're talking millions of people. Can you imagine Joshua telling millions of people, I don't want anyone to say a word. My friends, have you ever dealt with crowds before? Okay, you know, no one talk. What'd they say? Yeah, I mean, it's instant, you know. Or you got people in the back row whispering to one another, you know, all these different things. But I want to tell you, they're going to obey exactly. And there is a powerful lesson that we see in this. Every single step, they are going to obey exactly. And that's going to how they're going to get the victory. Because remember something. These are the people who watched an entire generation perish in the wilderness because of their disobedience. And the same thing is true in our lives. The only way we're going to have victory in our life is when we submit our hearts, our lives to the commander, to the Lord himself. And it's not my will be done. It's not trying to get God on my side. It's me being on God's side and me wanting to do what the Lord wants me to do. And the scripture goes on in verse number 11. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city going around at once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. 
And Joshua arose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns, went before the ark of the Lord, went on continually, and blew with the trumpets. But the armed men went before them, and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the priest continued to blow the trumpets. And the second day when they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, and so they did for six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day. On this day, the seventh day, the seventh day is the Sabbath, isn't it? Do you realize in God's law, it said, first of all, that the ark of God shouldn't be taken into battle. And my friends, the one time that the children of Israel tried to take the ark in, it didn't work out so good. Remember, it got stolen by the Philistines. They were defeated. Uh, The children of Israel were defeated and they lost the ark. All right. Also, God's law said not that ram's horns should be used in battle, but silver trumpets. The ram's horns were supposed to be used for the, the, the tabernacle and the worship of God. But God is having them blow the ram's horn. And of course, obviously, the Sabbath day, you shall do no work. On this day, they're going to have the battle. They're going to march around the city seven times. Why is that? Because it's a commander himself who is giving the instructions. And I want to tell you, our Sabbath, the fulfillment of the law of God is Jesus Christ. And we see a picture of this right here. So it came to pass on the seventh day. They rose early about the dawning of the day. They marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And on that day, they marched around the city seven times. And and the seventh time, it was so that when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now this city shall be doomed. I want to tell you, there is a judgment of God coming. In Revelation chapter 19, we see the Lord Jesus as the commander leading the armies of heaven to put an end to this world and this evil system that there is. But I also want you to look at this. This city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means keep yourself from the accursed things. Let you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron, they are consecrated to the Lord. And they shall come to the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. I've been to the ruins of Jericho many times. And it is an archaeological fact. This is what happened. And it goes on. Then the people went up for in the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you so, uh, swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. I want to tell you something. Although God, uh, judgment of God is coming, it is God's will that none should perish. I want to tell you, the story of Rahab is a powerful part of this truth. That any person in Jericho could have been saved in the very same way that Rahab the harlot was saved by turning to the Lord and believing in him. Rahab the harlot, a a heathen harlot, If a heathen whore could be saved, then anybody could be saved. I want to tell you, it is God's will that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. 
And how was she saved? Her house was on the wall. She had a window in her house. So evidently that part of the wall did not fall down. And there her house built into the wall. She was to tie a scarlet cord. She was told that anyone that you have that's a part of your family must be in the house. If they're outside the house, their blood is going to be upon their own head. That scarlet cord represents the blood of Jesus Christ because, my friends, none of us can be saved without his shed blood. And that red cord flying there in the wind would be that symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ which takes away our sin. And, my friends, she was saved. She was not only saved, but she became the great grandmother of King David, the greatest king in the history of Israel. She became not just someone in the kingdom, but a part of this line. And the New Testament, by the power of the Holy Spirit in in Matthew chapter 1, is the family tree of Jesus. It's the genealogy of Jesus. And what you have is so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so. I want to tell you, no one is begotten without a woman. Okay? All of us were born of a woman, no exclusions. But in this whole list of begottens, there's some wonderful godly women, but they're not mentioned. The Holy Spirit only names four women. One is Tamar. Uh, That's a sordid tell. We'll have to wait for another episode of Jerry Springer for this one. (laughs) Then you have Ruth, who is a foreigner, You have Rahab the harlot. And then you have the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Anyone remember what her name was? Oh yeah, that'd be Bathsheba, the one that King David committed adultery with and had her husband murdered. These are the women that are listed here. Why is that? Why only those four women? Why not the good mamas? Why aren't they listed? Because the Lord wants us to understand something. No matter how bad you have messed up your life, you can turn to the Lord and be saved. That we serve a God of redemption. When you look at that, it makes you feel better about your family, huh? When you look at the ladies that are mentioned that the Holy Spirit wants us to understand. So here's the thing. No one is beyond God's salvation. And the reason why I say that is Satan whispers in people's ears that what you have done is so bad, the Lord would never want you. What you have done is so bad, you could never be forgiven. And I want to share with you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is a pretty simple sentence, right? You want me to repeat it for you? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then it says, do not be deceived. Because I want to tell you, there are pastors and churches and the media and the government which are telling you other things. But here the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6 says, I don't want you to be deceived. And then it says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I don't think you need a theology degree to understand that, do you? They're pretty simple. And then it says this, and such were, that's past tense. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, I do not want you to raise your hands. But I know in this room today, there were those who were fornicators. I know in this room today there are are those that were adulterers. 
I know in this room today there are those who were idolaters. I know that there are those in this room today that were homosexuals and sodomites. And I want to tell you, you have been washed, you have been cleansed, and you have been justified in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what justified means? Just as if I'd never done it. Say it with me. Just as if I'd never done it. Again, just as if I'd never done it. That's a big hallelujah. Now, I know some of you. It should be a louder hallelujah than that. We've been justified. It's the Rahab, the harlot story. We have been born again. But my friends, I want to tell you something. The Bible is crystal clear on this. You live that way, you're not a part of the kingdom of God. And this is where the lies of the world are today. Do you realize today? I, I want to tell you something. I grew up in Kansas. And because we had a lot of farm girls in Kansas... We had, we, I, we, I knew a lot of girls who could throw a hay bale just as far as I could. There were lots of girls who were tomboys who, who were very strong. But I want to tell you something that's happening today. Little Sally that's in the third grade that's a tomboy and, li- and likes be, uh, playing with boys is being whispered in her ear that maybe you should be a boy. That God made a mistake. That you really shouldn't be a boy or a girl, that you should be a boy, and that sexuality is fluid and it's something that can change. And that's why here at our school, we have bathrooms where if you feel like you're a boy today, you can go in the boys' bathroom. If you feel like you're a girl today, you can go into the girls' bathroom. And let me tell you what's happening to little old Johnny, that eighth grade boy who's a late bloomer and a little bit of feminine. Somebody is whispering in his ear that maybe you are a girl. And they're telling these kids that you got to experiment to find out what you are, whether you're a homosexual or a heterosexual. Are you kidding me? You're telling kids to have sex of any kind? And I want to tell you, it is absolutely wrong, and it is against the Word of God. It's against the very nature of God. If you are born a boy, you're a boy. If you are born a girl, you're a girl. And my friends, here's the thing. Can people be tempted in other things? Of course they can. In the 40 years that I have been a pastor, I want to tell you something. Every homosexual that I've ever ministered to, there's one of two things. Either he was molested as a boy or he was molested by homosexual porn without fail. And my friends, again, there's twisting that takes place. But here's the reality. The world says that you're born that way. I want to ask you a question. Joe Blow over here committed adultery. Do we ever say to Joe Blow, well, you know, you're born that way. You can't help yourself. So whenever you feel like committing adultery, you can't help yourself. Just do it. Do we ever say that? Then why do we say anything else? Why do we give other exclusions? Because the word of God says something different. And here's the thing. No matter what we faced in our life, no matter what failures there have been in our life, Can we change? We were these things, but we have been washed. We've been cleansed. I knew people who were fornicators. They made a habit of it. But I know that when they came to Jesus Christ, their life changed and they walked the straight path since that. Hallelujah. Are you glad we can be born again? Are you glad we can be justified? Are you glad we can be like Rahab the harlot and find salvation? I want to tell you, we serve an awesome God who gives us the victory. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's stand. And let's pray together. Because my friends, this lesson that the Lord gives us today is all about this. It is all about us surrendering our lives to the commander of the Lord. 
It's all about us living in obedience. Not what we want, not the, what the world says is popular, but what the truth of God's word says. And my friends, when we do that, we are going to have victory in our lives. And so let's pray together right now. And that's what we're going to pray for. So if you don't feel like praying it, don't do it. But I hope your heart is such that you want to surrender to the commander of the Lord's army, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I do want to surrender my life to you. You are the commander. And I want to follow you. I want to be on your side. I want to surrender my heart. I want to ask for forgiveness for my sins. And I thank you so much, Lord, that you died upon the cross to pay the price for all my sins. And I thank you so much that you have forgiven me. And I thank you so much that you have justified me. And that I can be a new creation in Christ Jesus. Just like Rahab the harlot. And be a part of the kingdom of God. In Jesus name. Amen.